Welcome to Healthy Dialogue, the podcast of the Alliance of Community Health Plans. Here's your host, ACHP CEO, Cece Connolly. Something pretty interesting and kind of predictable has happened to consumer behavior during the pandemic. No, no, I'm not talking about the hoarding of toilet paper or the world briefly running out of Dr. Pepper. What's more interesting is how we're shopping. As many of us try to limit our trips to the grocery store and also avoid some of those overinflated prices on the high demand items, we've gone to our happy place online. Here's a stat for you. In June, e-commerce was up 76% in the U.S. 76% is a big bump for an already booming industry. So here's how it goes. We pour a glass of wine, put on our pajamas, hop on the computer, scan a few websites, compare prices, read reviews, click on a decision, and wait for that package at the front door. Some of us go to great lengths to find the best deal out there. It's kind of like a game that we really like to win, but we don't shop for healthcare that way, basically because the prices are invisible. In fact, very few healthcare companies even give us those nifty shop and compare tools that work so great for hotels and rental cars. Quick shout out here to Priority, Select Health, Presbyterian, and Health Partners. They're notable exceptions and do have those nifty tools, by the way. But let's be honest, if healthcare prices were visible across the board, you'd probably choke on that glass of wine. You might see, no, no, correction, you would see that a $4,000 MRI in your neighborhood is just a thousand bucks 50 miles away. Not kidding about this. So a question for all of our Healthy Dialogue listeners. If you did see that a $4,000 MRI was available for $1,000 50 miles away, would you drive those 50 miles? Or would you simply think to yourself, hey, I pay my premium every month and the insurance company is on the hook for this anyway, so I'll go for convenience. Today, we're going to examine price and quality transparency in healthcare. It's my pleasure today to welcome Shannon Brownlee, Senior Vice President of the Lown Institute. A longtime industry advocate, Shannon co-founded the Right Care Alliance and previously directed health policy at the New America Foundation. She is the author of Overtreated, Why Too Much Medicine is Making Us Sicker and Poorer, which was named the best economics book of 2007 by the New York Times. And like me, Shannon is a former journalist. We're glad you could join us. Happy to be here, Cece. Shannon, you and I over the years have, I think, shared a little bit of a passion, which is our concern. If I were to steal your book title, it would be Overtreated. Other people may refer to this as inappropriate or low value care. Some folks call it waste. The estimates are that up to one third of healthcare spending in the US is not necessary. Let me ask you to just very quickly level set, where are we today when it comes to appropriate high value care in this country and all that other bad stuff? (laughs) So, you know, I wrote the book more than a decade ago, and there were certainly people within healthcare who said, oh my God, you wrote the book I wanted to write. This is really a big problem. There were lots of people who also said, what are you talking about? The problem is we don't have enough care, we don't have enough coverage. I think we're now at the point that there's much greater awareness that there is a lot of inappropriate, unnecessary services delivered in our system. And I think that there are efforts underway to address it. The problem is, thus far, those efforts haven't really made much of a dent. And I don't think they are going to, because I don't think healthcare institutions have that big an incentive to do something about it. 
Can you elaborate on that, Shannon, the notion that big healthcare institutions are not incentivized to tackle, which to me, this is something that is outrageous, frankly. (laughs) It's outrageous if you think of it from the patient's perspective, because one of the things we know is that there's no free lunch in medicine. There's nothing that a doctor can do to a patient for a patient that doesn't carry some level of risk of harm. And so if you're delivering, if you're a physician delivering a service the patient doesn't need, the risk of harm is still there. And so the patient could be needlessly harmed. So That's a problem from the patient's perspective, but from the provider's perspective, especially for the hospital, there's not a lot of incentive not to do stuff because you effectively get paid to do more. You get paid more to do more. So in addition, getting rid of overuse means you have to make your physicians do things differently, and that's hard to do. I should have taken one step back at the beginning, Shannon, and just asked you to give our listeners a couple of your favorite examples of inappropriate, low-value care, over-treatment, the kinds of examples that my mother and your mother would understand. So one of them that, that has been around for a very long time, and there has been some movement, but it's still a big problem, which is the inappropriate use of antibiotics. Giving people antibiotics for what is almost certainly a viral infection not only doesn't do anything about the viral infection, it also increases their risk of having side effects and it increases antibiotic resistance. You have led a remarkable project at the Lown Institute over, I, I think it's I think it's been many months. You'll you'll tell us the Lown Institute Hospital Index is now available. Can you tell a little bit what that is? And then I want to get to how it might be used. You bet. The the index is a new way of ranking hospitals. We look at hospital performance, but we look at it from a much broader perspective than other rankings do, like the U.S. News Best Hospitals. Most other rankings look at performance in terms of patient outcomes, mortality, mostly in-hospital mortality, 30-day mortality. And we look at that as well. But we also look at other things, including civic leadership and value. And the one metric that we have for value right now is rates of delivery of unnecessary services. We look at 13 different unnecessary low-value services. For civic leadership, we look at things like community benefit spending as a percentage of operating expenses. We look at pay equity And we look at inclusivity. Is the hospital doing a good job of taking care of the minorities, the people of low income, and the people with low education who are out there in their catchment area? But for this conversation, you know, the overuse question, how much are hospitals delivering these 13 services? We were shocked by some of our findings. Many, many hospitals overused a lot of the 13 services that we looked at. And some hospitals did a really good job of avoiding it. There was just this huge range of performance. So take that one step further, Shannon. If there are people that would like to see us address overtreatment or low-value care, can this hospital index help? You bet. I can see Medicare Advantage programs, for example, contracting with hospitals that have low rates of overuse. I can see plans saying to hospitals that they have contracts with, listen, you know, your overuse rates are a lot higher than, say, a hospital across town or even a hospital in your own system. We think that you could do better. And that's a way that plans could actually use the index to start to move the needle on overuse. And the hospitals are going to have to figure out how they're going to do it. You've talked about what I call the perverse financial incentives in fee-for-service medicine, where clinicians do more. And part of the reason they do more is that's how they get paid. But it seems to me there's a cultural or social element to this. And especially if I'm looking at this through the lens of a community health plan, often if you are the player that is trying to reduce low value services, the accusation is you are rationing care, you are denying me 
fill in the blank. How do we deal with that? This is a big problem. So to go back to the first part of your question about sort of what are the what are the factors that contribute to overuse? At one point, I listed every single factor that had ever been documented in the, in the literature. It was something like 36 different factors. So obviously, money is not the only motivator. I don't think that very many physicians who are doing, say, inappropriate colonoscopies are sitting there saying, you know, another colonoscopy, another sale on my boat. They're doing it because they believe it's the right thing to do. They believe it. They do it because they were taught to do it. They do it because they're worried about malpractice. They do it because patients come in expecting, say, an MRI because they've had a few twinges in their low back and it doesn't seem to be going away. They do it for a, a panoply of reasons in addition to the fact that fee-for-service helps drive it. So we we have to think about this as this sort of multifactorial problem and you have to have multifactorial solutions. I do think that protecting physicians in a special way from malpractice suits when they did not do something inappropriate, it needs to be thought about. Okay. So that makes a lot of sense. We're sitting here, of course, in Washington, D.C., and so I need to ask you if there are policy recommendations for Congress or an administration to start to reduce unnecessary, inappropriate care. So it depends on what level you want to look at the problem. If you want to look at it at the hospital level, certainly the public publishing of the rates of overuse is one way to get hospitals actually getting aware of what they're doing and how they compare to other hospitals. Hospital administrators pay attention to that stuff. And, you know, we're doing that with the Lown Hospitals Index. Another way is for things like Medicare Advantage and Medicare to start making it clear to hospitals that they're not enthusiastic about paying for inappropriate care. I don't think there's been that much concerted effort by payers to do that. And I know that one of the reasons is that payers are really worried about the sort of public perception, as you said, that you're rationing needed services. My doctor says, I really need this proton beam treatment. Who are you, the insurer, to say that, A, there's no evidence for proton beam, and B, it costs more than it should, and C, we're not going to pay for it. So policy-wise, I actually am in a little bit of a loss about how we do this from a policy perspective, except through the payers, except through the government payers in particular. Well, I do like your notion of government using its leverage as a purchaser of healthcare as much as a regulatory body. I think there's great potential there. Let me just close. You have worked on this issue for such a long time. I imagine there are some days when it can be discouraging and feel like a real uphill battle. But do you have any bright spot on the horizon, successes, progress that you want to share and that you'd like to see spread more broadly? You know, it's funny, I've been thinking about this a lot, because when I did start on this, I, you know, people really did look at me like my hair was on fire, or I was a drooling idiot. And now this is an entire field of research. The problem of overuse is now being looked at from lots of different angles and papers are being published. Now papers being published doesn't necessarily lead to real change, but it is part of the process of increasing awareness. I also see stories about it in the press, and that means the patients are going to be more aware of it. And I think that's absolutely essential for this to really change. So I'm actually kind of hopeful. And and I'm still interested in writing papers about it and getting the ideas out there. Well, that is terrific. We certainly want you to keep at it. And we at the Alliance of Community Health Plans are going to try to do our part as well. And let me just say, as somebody who occasionally feels like lighting her hair on fire, you go, girl. (laughs) Thank you, Cece. It's always so nice to talk to you. Thank you, Shannon. And we'll be back with more of ACHP's Healthy Dialogue after a quick message from our sponsor. WellFrame strategically partners with health plans nationwide to reimagine the relationship between plans and members. By combining innovative AI-enabled solutions, strategic partnerships, and passionate conviction, WellFrame creates a measurable impact on lives at scale. 
Learn more about their digital health management solutions at Wellframe.com. Next, we are joined by Diane Holder, President and CEO of UPMC Health Plan in Pittsburgh. Diane plays a crucial role in weeding out low value services and implementing value based programs that reduce costs and improve health outcomes. Her organization is also a leader in addressing unmet social needs in the community. UPMC is truly in the vanguard of top health organizations, and we are so fortunate she could make time to join us today. Diane, welcome to Healthy Dialogue. Thank you. It's great to be here with you, Cece. And we have so many incredible things happening in healthcare that we could be discussing, but we're going to spend some time really focusing on this notion of value in healthcare. Some people want healthcare to cost less. Some people talk about quality. Let's just do a quick refresher, Diane, on how you describe value in healthcare and why is it so important? So great question. To me, value is really about that intersection between quality and access. And access is heavily driven by affordability. So whenever we're talking about how does a certain kind of procedure, medical service, pharmacy benefit, how are all of those things, do they, how do they come together to impact you as an individual for your health? And how do you maximize the ability to actually receive maximum quality in the most affordable way? And to me, you really can't talk about healthcare in this country without recognizing that we have a lot of care that's terrific and wonderful that's provided to people, but we also have a lot of care and services that are unnecessary and really not providing the value to people that they could. And I always say to people, and when I think about it myself, I I say, you know, we have one dollar. And every time we spend any part of that one dollar on something that doesn't really bring value, it means there's other things we can't do. And I think part of what has to be addressed in healthcare is if we're going to spend twice as much money as every other industrialized country in the world on healthcare, shouldn't we see the value for that healthcare? And if we're going to get a different approach, can we begin to find ways that we can use our dollars more wisely? Well, and I love that concept of you have one dollar, one dollar to spend. And I think maybe over the past several decades, there's been a little bit of a notion in the United States that, hey, we've got unlimited dollars to spend, (laughs) which (laughs) might be part of the problem. (laughs) Right. Right. And if you're going to make way for some of the new technologies and new innovations, you know, think of some of the medication costs now that are, are very high. And some of those medications perhaps are not necessary, but others truly are. And we want to be able to give people better access to medications that really work for them. But if we don't get rid of things that don't help, then we have no room in the $1 to make way for the things that are coming in the future and are here now that that we need to incorporate into our spending pattern. I want to come back in a minute to the notion of very expensive therapies because UPMC is doing some really cutting edge research there. But before we do, I want to pose a question to you. Is it possible, are you in fact in a position to create affordability in healthcare or make healthcare more affordable? So I think that healthcare providers and healthcare insurers can do their part to make this a more accessible, affordable, value-driven system. And I think, you know, my bias is that when you bring the payer and the provider together, you get a better synergy to try to make that possible because you can work together to create innovation. You can see how the whole picture fits together and you can experiment with different alternative payment models, 
or different ways of doing things that you don't have to go ask somebody else's permission to get dollars to try. And if it works, great, you can try to scale it. And we've done that a lot. The innovation space, I think, is incredibly important for us to continue to drive. And, you know, from my point of view, we've been able to accomplish a lot of that. Affordability stays front and center because if we don't keep our eye on that and people talk so much about access, but, but access has to be put in the context of I can improve access when I can make it more affordable for people. I can improve access when I can make it more salient for people, when I can help people understand what's important and what isn't, when I can participate with my patients and my members in shared decision making, when I can really begin to take advantage of the fact that we can message and create benefits as a payer and a provider that can really work together. Oh, and I'll add one more thing there, that I don't think we can do this by ourselves. So I don't think it's just a payer and just a provider coming together. I think we have seen, and especially I think it's true when you start to look at so much of the other kind of impacts that happen that have impact on your health. So whether it's your housing or the zip code you live in with the amount of poverty or the, or the kinds of environmental impacts and a lot of the other problems from socioeconomic perspective. I think we really have to partner with broader community entities that allow us to come together to try to address some of those issues that really do drive health outcomes. So you're getting at such an important issue right now. Some people will refer to it as social determinants of health or unmet social needs. You mentioned socioeconomic issues. And and I think that many, including yourself and all of UPMC, have known this and focused on these challenges for quite some time. But others got the rude awakening through the COVID-19 crisis of the disparities here. If I'm not mistaken, you have, uh, first of all, a center for high value healthcare, which we want to hear a little bit more about the center. But then specifically, I believe you've drilled down to have a social innovation center. Is that right, Diane? Yes, correct. So about a decade ago, we created in the insurance division of UPMC, something called the Center for High Value Healthcare. And it was our opportunity at that point Point to really look very, very systematically at how you would sit at the crossroads of studying affordability and quality, kind of looking at what are the opportunities to scale things that can address some of the combination of behavioral, medical, psychosocial needs that people have. And through that center, we are able to bring community partners to the table, get a lot of input from various kinds of stakeholders, our our patients, our members, try to bring our physicians to the table and our researchers to the table, because we are a very large academic medical center. And one of the things that we are able to look at is how can you combine the different needs and address different kinds of problems. So for example, we started a program many years ago with HUD, where the health plan paid for social support provided into a living situation for people who had serious mental illness. They received HUD dollars to rent apartments, and we were able to coordinate care for all of our members who were residing in these HUD arranged living situations. And then we were able to help support them in not only their medical care, their behavioral health needs, and their housing needs. And what we found was a positive outcome, both in terms of quality, people were better able to adhere to medication regimes, they were able to get to the doctor more readily, they were able to care for themselves, they were able to stay in their apartments, and they were using less emergency and unplanned inpatient care because they had a wraparound social support model that supported them beyond their needs of just the medications they take or the doctors they see. And so to me, that was a very good program. Well, and one of the things that has always impressed me is that in your role as CEO, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that you are still looking at these approaches and programs and 
pilots with the lens of ROI in one way or another. This is not just, gosh, you're being awfully nice citizens. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think the the reason that's so important, other than, you know, it, it makes good business sense, is that, you know, we don't know what works exactly. And we don't know all the levers we need to pull and all the things we need to put in place. And we don't know exactly what to do for whom. So part of what's important in setting up a strict methodology around these kinds of programs is to then measure what is the return on that investment. So if we're going to invest in psychosocial support or personnel that we can put into a housing situation to support our members, or if we're going to invest in additional transportation or in food supplements or all the kinds of things that I think plans are trying to determine how to pay for, because I go back to there is one dollar, how do we afford to do the things that we think are appropriate? So it seems to me if we're having a conversation about value and affordability and even return on investment in healthcare today, we'd be remiss if we did not bring up drug prices. Right. Pharmacy is a budget buster for a lot of American families today and a lot of health plans. So have you got any encouraging (laughs) news on this front? So, you know, we have been working long and hard on this escalating cost problem, and we've done a number of things. I mean, one of the things at a more basic level that we've tried to do is be appropriately managing the kinds of medications and doing a lot of member and patient education about impact of different kinds of medications and you know, why this choice versus that choice might be good. One costs you $4, one costs you 400 How How do we help educate people? You know, for a very long time, and I think still today in many cases, physicians were not particularly aware of the price of the drugs they were prescribing. So we've been trying to be, you know, very transparent and providing a lot of education so that our physicians understand the implications because not only is it a cost driver for healthcare in general, but it's hard hitting for patients and and members to, to pay some of the dollars they have to pay out of pocket. So we've done some basic things like formulary management and those, those important things to do, but we've, and education. We've also done things like putting total cost of care risk arrangements in place with our physician groups, many of them where they're looking at what's an effective medication and how do we really make sure that we're getting the value out of that medication? How do we make sure the patient's being educated properly? Because a lot of times patients will have quick side effects and never take the rest of the expensive medication and that doesn't get fed back rapidly enough to the doctor. So we need to close those communication loops, which we do do with a lot of our technology platforms. The other thing we've done, which is most probably a a fairly recent innovation for us, is in our Center for High Value Healthcare, we've also created a pharmacy center. And we were one of the first plans in the country to do value-based payment arrangements with some of the pharmaceutical companies. And so, for example, what that means is that we have a certain rate that we would pay for a drug, but in a value-based payment, the outcome has to be the ones we agreed to if the cost to us is going to be the amount that it typically is. So it's either going to go up or down to us based on what those outcomes are. But I also hear you talking a lot about things that matter to patients and family members, like, can I get back to work and and hold down my job? Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's a broader definition of value, if you will. And I think it's so important because it's connecting to patients. I want to close us out here. I've heard you speak a number of times using phrases member-centric and provider-aligned. What about those two phrases? So... From my point of view, it is our most important role to ensure that our health plan members have the best access, the best quality, the best outcomes, and the highest satisfaction they can have for an affordable price. And to me, that means that we need to wrap our strategies, our inputs, our priorities around our members, and in many cases, those members are patients of the UPMC system, 
because there is a Venn diagram overlap with many of our members are also served by our provider system. Many are served by others, but many at UPMC. Provider aligned to me means that we understand that is it is the clinical delivery system, the doctors, the nurses, the social workers, the pharmacists that are touching our members slash their patients and that we need to be as supportive to them as possible in order to do our primary job, which is to support and help our members. And so to me, sometimes people accuse healthcare in general as being provider centric. They're doing what they need to do for themselves. Absolutely. And such an important note to close this conversation about value on with you. I just want to say, Diane Holder, thank you for joining us on Healthy Dialogue. Well, thank you, Cece. It was terrific to be with you. Before we go any further, Cece needs a minute. Remember back when Congress approved the initial $350 billion for the payroll protection program to keep small businesses afloat during the pandemic? That's about the same amount of money that Americans spend every year on prescription drugs. $350 billion. Do the math. It works out to about a thousand bucks per American. And yet, Very few policymakers have shown any appetite for reining in big pharma. Our laws actually protect mega brands, make it harder to bring generics and biosimilars to market, allow for indefinite patents that discourage competition. And look, if the drug companies don't like something, they're either going to sue or buy off the competition. So when we talk about transparency in healthcare, we can't do justice to that topic without including prescription drugs in the conversation. And as confusing as other healthcare prices may seem, drug prices are a giant black box. Now, Senator Tammy Baldwin introduced the Fair Drug Pricing Act almost a year and a half ago, and it is still sitting there. No one's claiming it would be the cure-all for high drug costs, but it would be a start. So what do you say, folks? Can we start there? Here's a little piece of what you'll hear on Episode 5 of Healthy Dialogue as we dive into the social determinants of health. Two-thirds of all medical episodes in the U.S. have some basis in social determinants, such as food insecurity, housing insecurity, transportation issues, personal safety, pollution, lousy tap water, unsteady employment, and the list goes on. But hang on a sec. That two-thirds was before the pandemic. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Healthy Dialogue. Learn more about the Alliance of Community Health Plans at ECHP.org and click the Add to Contacts button to connect directly with our team. We hope you'll also find us on Twitter at underscore ACHP and on LinkedIn. And if you liked today's episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. Reviews help new listeners find our podcast and hopefully spur more healthy dialogue out there.